Agent Carter, Season 1, Episode 5, Thoughts. This episode is called The Iron Ceiling. So, another episode I love. Spoilers for everything MCU leading up to and including this episode. The top link in the description box will enable you to donate to the SAG After Strikers. And then there's some links to the videos that will explain why this is such an important strike. So, let's dive into the episode. So, yeah, we open in Russia in 1937 and... The, the, um, I have, um, hmm, I mean, should I say the, I guess I'll just call them the, the Russian girls, just in case, because I don't know if we're supposed to know yet, I'm pretty sure I know who the Russian girls are. Anyway, yes. Um, so the yeah, the Russian girls. You know, we see they wake up and they're you know handcuffed to the beds, and we see at the end of the episode, Dottie still sleeps like that. She, you know, just yeah, really, really creepy. So so the conditioning is still active. These you know, let's see, nine years later, I guess it is, and yeah, you know, oh, she's excellent at ballet. Yeah, that, you know, that is something that a number of, you know, young Eastern European women are, you know, pushed into getting good at. It's it's a way to make sure, you know, that, you're, that you and your, your family can do well, you know, it can, it's, you know, you can get a career there. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, we see the you know, the the torture that they're, you know, put through, the, the you know, they're forced to, to watch Snow White, and, you know, it's it's the Daily Wire version, yeah, yeesh. Anyway, no, the, the yeah, you know, they, they have to say all the, the lines as they're being said in the movie. This is how they perfect, you know, being able to speak English without a Russian accent, which is, of course, crucial if they're going to be able to, you know, infiltrate. And, yeah, very, very tense. The, you know, I, I quite appreciate the detail that, you know, she, she breaks the bread in half and gives it to the other, and there's a smile, there's a connection there. And later she does the same thing with Peggy. And, you know, we see the, the fight and she kills... I gotta say, it went by kind of fast, and my memory and ADHD are acting up. Did she kill the girl that she had handed bread to? Like, I guess it might be... So yeah, yeah, it's like a way to lower to get the other person to lower their guard, and that's what she was doing with, with Peggy as well. You know, after all, if you're in a, a not-wonderful situation and someone share some resources, that's gonna, you know, you're gonna think, okay, this this person, you know, I can trust this person. And I love the cut from, you know, it's, we see the the move to, to kill, and we hear the, the like, I, I think it's like a neck snap or something, smash cut, and, and Dottie wakes up, and it's like clear, oh, that, you know, she was one of the you know, and, and yeah, the there's an actress uh, um, credited as 10-year-old Dottie. And the, let's see, we have the... Yeah, and, you know, she's asking Peggy, and I, I like the detail. You know, she doesn't know the word ennui. And they, they know, you know, wow, Angie sure is being overdramatic that she's overcome with ennui, and that's why she can't work... You know, but but yeah, that is the kind of thing that you know you're not gonna learn what ennui means in, in English in Russia. You know, that's the the so so that's a, a good detail that there's certain words that are too diff you know too unique for her to have learned in the and you know she says she wants to you know, travel, and Peggy says the the spirit of Lady Liberty 
is in the people, which is a great, yeah. And, yeah, and, and you know, Dottie accidentally knocks over the, the purse. And she's like, no, Peggy, let me, I'm, I'm the klutz, I knocked over your purse, I will pick everything up. And she does, she's she technically everything that was in the purse, Dottie picks up. She just doesn't put everything back, is the thing. And yeah, you know, why would Peggy suspect? Dottie is being so nice. And yeah, you know, she stole the, the key to Peggy's room at the Griffith. Very clever. And Jarvis tries to convince Peggy that, you know, the, the, what's the word? Um, tries to convince Peggy that he didn't, you know, he's, he feels bad about lying to her. And, you know, we get some, some great quotes, um, hold on, did... Um, yeah, you know, Mr. Stock has the greatest admiration only for himself, Burn. And then he, you know, Jarvis says he can be thoughtless, inconsiderate, vain, childish, unreliable, arrogant. You flatter him. Let's see. And yeah, the, you know, they're trying to translate the cipher and the, the, you know, Peggy is the only one who is able to, and, yeah, you know, says that she should be on the the mission. You know, she knows the, the yeah, she knows about Russia. She was at the, the Russian front. And she brings in the Howling Commandos. Love to see them again. I was a little surprised that later in this episode, John Glover shows up. I guess it's possible that this will change. I think this might be the first time I've seen him in a comic book related thing where he wasn't a bad guy. Like, he's... And he's good at it. He's real good at playing bad guys in, in comic book adaptations. You know, like... If it's been a minute since you watched Batman and Robin... Yeah, I understand that, you know, that movie's terrible, but he's a lot of fun in it. And, let's see. Yeah, you know, obviously Smallville, you know, it's not a, not a huge surprise that the father of Lex Luthor is also bad. I feel like there's one more, but I can't quite place it, but yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and we have the the locker room scene, and yeah, um, I don't. You know, it's still this thing of of the the show. You know, trying to say women can be everything that men can be, which I do think. You know, I I don't think that women are lesser. I don't think the show is doing the best job at conveying that message though you know which again too bad i think other stuff in the mcu has done better and yeah from very early on in this episode early in the mission jack is very like there's clearly something going on and you know apparently it is the first real jump he's done. The the other jumps were all training jumps. And I think it is also, you know, he's already thinking about the, you know, the experience he had that turned bad. Which I will talk about later in this video. And... <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, Sousa realizes that that's Peggy in the, the photo. You know, he sees the, um, let's see, it was like, it was actual, like, injury, like, scars that she had on her shoulder 
in the locker room and were also visible on the on the dress. And yeah, it is you know, it's it's a it's a good detail because yeah, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, back then you couldn't really do anything about you know, that that kind of scarring and the the yeah, just very very nicely done. I I really like how gradually getting closer to, you know, it's becoming more dangerous for her. And yeah, Jack retells his his war story about killing these you know, Japanese soldiers and the the yeah, you know, that does get him some respect from the Howling Commandos. And we learn that Howard Stark was cleaning up the massacre and, you know, got in this fist fight with a guy much bigger than him and a, you know, military guy. So, you know, obviously he's not winning that fight. And, you know, he, does, he himself doesn't have military training. And... You know, then he cuts t ties with the U.S. military. And now, you know, Howard is public enemy number one. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, and, and yeah, John Glover's SSR informant. Uh, you know, he's, like, Dooley says, no, no, we have evidence. And Glover says, but you don't know the whole story, you know. And let's see. Yeah, uh, Jack suggests four teams of two. Peggy says it makes more sense to have two teams of four. And he does agree that, you know, I, I appreciate that, you know, by the end of this episode, he does respect her more. And good detail that the film has this coded message. What was it like? Instill fear or something like that. And, you know, they hear a crying child, and it's like, I mean, gotta help out, you know, you don't automatically, think, you know, I'm, that's, you know, the reason that she's there is in case someone comes in, you know, because if, instead of a crying child, if it was like a sentry or something, it'd be like, okay, you know, that's the enemy, we, we you know, we take him out before we proceed. But a crying child is like, oh, they kidnapped this. Oh, this is horrible. You know, we have to. The <clears throat> and and Dum Dum Dugan even does. You know, Neil McDonough great in in as this character. He even does the. You know, he's oh, you you like the the hat. Well, you see, it's called a bowler, and the reason why. Why is it called a bowler? Peggy, you know, which is like, okay, if, you know, if the kid hadn't attacked, this is where Peggy approaches and explains to the girl why it's called a bowler and they're building rapport, you know, but the girl was just waiting, for, like, I guess she must have been told by the, the, you know, the, yeah, teachers, let's go with that that, you know, this is a way that you can manipulate someone into, you know, he lowers his guard, she has this knife, and stabs him, and it's like, you know, yeah, good thing he had the, the body armor, because that is not like, the, you know, she's she's been trained very carefully, she knows exactly where, to, that is, in fact, an extremely dangerous place to get stabbed, um, it's this, th let's see, it's been a while since I, but it, it's this thing of, like, there's a lot of places in, in the torso where, if, you know, the, the rib cage will block a lot. But the specific place that she stabbed was a place where there is a little bit of a, a gap, you know, and it really is only because he was wearing armor that he survived that, so great detail, like, she was waiting for the exact right moment, and it's also this sort of thing of, like, yeah, you know, if not for the body armor, she would have literally killed him. That's much more efficient than if she, like, stabbed a leg or a hand or something. 
and you know she grabs the gun, manages to to shoot one of the guys to death. Just yeah, really. So so you know clearly she's had firearms training as well. And let's see, yeah. And Dooley approaches uh, Jarvis and says, you know, this is not a witch hunt. Which let's see, was at that? No, they, yeah, I believe that was before Trump had started abusing the crap out of that word but yeah you know we're looking for the truth which honestly I believe him uh, maybe I'll be proven wrong about that in a later episode but no he seems to legitimately you know it, it is just this thing of like you know they they do have to investigate they have to take a claim like that seriously you know during the Cold War you know like we realize today the like you know uh, the the Soviet Union managed to put on a much better front than you know was realistic for at least all of the the Cold War actually yeah I guess was it crap it's been a long time since I looked at like the the dates and such I've I I'm not 100% sure how good or bad the the situation was for the the Soviet Union in 1946 which is when this episode is set but but yeah, you know there was a serious fear of all you know planetary nuclear annihilation. Yeah, you got you can't you know the the and and Howard Stark within the MCU, the the most brilliant inventor of the entire world at the time. It's extremely important to to determine if he is intentionally selling weapons to the Russians and let's see yeah great scene of Dottie in Peggy's room and I like that you know she she catches that there's this little thing to to make sure you know just, uh, let's see if if someone breaks into Peggy's room if they don't reset the, the little thing Peggy will know that someone was in there and you know she's and Dottie looks in the mirror and imitates Peggy, and it's so creepy. It's like, ah, oh, just so, so, yeah. I mean, Dottie is intending to steal Peggy Carter's identity, which would definitely, you know, open some doors for her. So just, yeah, really, really, I, I, I really enjoy her, her character. I, I'm... I'm always excited to find out more about Dottie Underwood. I, I, yeah, very, very cool. She, honestly, she might be my favorite character of the show, at least so far. Holy crap, just, yeah. And, and she's just, like, she's played by Bridget Regan. Fantastic performance. Just this, like, she's got the, she can do the, the creepy, you know, the, the, the creepy facial expression, but she can also seem like, innocent and like when she knocks over the purse like imagine if she couldn't play innocent well if she you know if she was still like stone-faced and is like you know they're okay Peggy would definitely realize there was something going on but she's completely convincing and let's see yeah great uh, gunfight near the end of the episode and yeah Jack freezes up at at first I thought it might be the PTSD but I yeah I I'm not 100% certain if that is what it actually is I I appreciate that his character like honestly this was an episode that really helped me appreciate like some of the characters here are more complex than I you know Peggy was complex in Captain America 1 and they're they're continuing they're building on that so that's great. No complaints there. I was I wasn't thinking that Jack and Dooley were going to turn out to be complex. Um, and we also, you know, Sousa, like by the end of the episode, knows for sure Peggy is the woman in in the you know who went to the club, and he's clearly conflicted about it. You know, the the like if he was a simple or one note character, either he would hide it. Or he would confront her, but the fact that he's like holding back and and like just yeah, and I'm really excited to find out is he actually going to to like because if he, you know, 
is it, yeah, is he going to confront her? Is he going to reveal it without her knowing, or without her knowing at first at least? Which would be the thing that you would want to do if if you're 100% dedicated to the SSR rather than a specific person. And <laughs> Dum Dum Dugan suggests, you know, he miss you, Miss Union Jack. Never speak again. <laughs> Fair enough. And, yeah, you know, Jack actually respects uh, Peggy now. You know, he's like, I owe you a bourbon. And, you know, yeah, he explains the, the Japanese that he killed were carrying a white flag. He didn't realize until after, and then he buried it instead of suffering the shame of people realizing that he killed some people that were trying to surrender, which, you know, he, he said, oh, you know, if I had waited another second, they would have stabbed my commanding officer in the throat. You know, that was probably what he thought in the exact moment. But, you know, in retrospect, maybe they weren't trying to kill him. Maybe they were just like, nudging him to wake him up so that they could surrender, you know, and yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that, uh, you know, and, and sadly America does, like, America did not handle the surrender of Japan right, and, and yeah, I really appreciate this, you know, like, Jack has seemed like this, you know, all American man, you know, incredible, like American military person, you know, and yeah, so so you know, he serves as a representation of America, the country, and yeah, he he mishandled it. You know, I mean, I mean, you could almost say it sound what he describes sounds like a, a sort of Pearl Harbor attack, and. Yeah, he he respond he he went nuclear, if you will, in response. Yeah, really really excited to see where you know this is a show. Every episode, I like the show even more than than before, and it started pretty high. So some IMDb trivia for this episode. After the transmitter turns on and types an encoded message, the SSR tasks several scientists with decoding it. One of them is heard saying, it is not a German message or the Turing method would work. He is referring to the method used by Dr. Alan Turing to successfully decrypt Nazi codes produced by the Enigma machine. Turing's achievement is set by historians to have cut World War II short by as long as two years, saving as many as an estimated 14 million lives. And sadly, afterwards, they they really treated Turing terribly. You know, he he was a gay man that was illegal at the time, and he died. Let's see. Yeah, he went to prison. I crap. I feel like I heard that he died in prison. It's been a long time since I looked at the. But but yeah, you know, treated terribly because of bigotry. Just even though he saved all these lives. Now. <laughs> writer Jose Molina wanted to promote the character of Dum Dum Dugan from Corporal to Sergeant, but actor Neil McDonough objected because he wanted to wear the same helmet with insignia he did in Captain America the First Avenger. And, uh, yeah, Happy Sam Sawyer, Jun Junior Juniper, Pinky Pinkerton were originally Howling Commandos alongside Nick Fury in the comics. And, uh, let's see... Oh... Actors Kenneth Choi and Derek Luke were willing to reprise the roles of Howling Commandos Jim Morita and Gabe Jones, respectively, but were ultimately unable because of scheduling conflicts. That sucks. You know, it is it is very cool that Kenneth Choi, you know, he later, he plays Principal Morita in Spider-Man Homecoming, and, you know, he does appear to indeed be the descendant of Jim Morita. And huh, the exterior shot of the Russian school is actually a shot of Dartmoor Prison in Devon, England. And huh, right, and yeah, uh, someone points out 
that they watched Snow White and Seven Dwarves in 1937, even though, you know, it, yeah, it premiered in on December 21st of 1937 in Los Angeles. wasn't re released anywhere else until 1938 or later. Okay. During previous episodes, communication through the typewriter was never in code. I can't tell if that's supposed to be. So the one I read just before was definitely meant to be a goof, and someone didn't know how to add it, or it was rejected, maybe. But the... Um, let's see... Um, I think that might be about... Right, so, um, I mean, I think the idea is that, you know, it is a trap. The, they, were, they were hoping to lure in as many agents as possible to, to take them out. Or maybe even take um, prisoners, interrogate. You know, the, the, it's true that during previous episodes, the typewriter was just, you know, English, but the SSR wouldn't know that, and yeah, you know the the like I would definitely say the the communication was specifically supposed to lure in, you know. So yeah, it's in Russian so that it's more convincing. And oh. When deciding which new members of the Howling Commandos to introduce, writer Jose Molina jumped at the chance to introduce the first gay comic book-based character into the MCU in the form of Pinky Pinkerton. Very cool. And, yeah, someone else pointed out that John Glover played Lionel Luther on Smallville. And... Let's see... And right, yeah, there, yes, there is a Union Jack superhero. Uh, let's see, yeah, first appeared in Marvel Comics in the Invaders, Invaders number seven before appearing in Captain America Volume One, number two hundred and fifty-four. The alter ego of Union Jack is James Montgomery Falsworth, who appears in Captain America: The First Avenger, played by J.J. Field. So, yeah, very cool, and. Let's see. I am slightly torn when it comes to. So, Nicola is. You know, yeah. Dr. Ivchenko describes him as burdened, not mad. He sees things in dimensions that we can only imagine. You look at a field of grass, you see pretty picture. He sees biology, phytochemistry, keeping his gift from overwhelming him. This group requires discipline, stability, and since Leviathan took his family, stability does not come easy. I provide the discipline he needs. And, yeah. Um, the fact that he does end up taking, you know, trying to, to basically get the the Russians to stop shooting at them and become you know yeah get freed the the yeah um, I don't know there's a there's a history of American media like saying you know oh once you have a mental condition that's it you're just there's no hope for you kind of thing I'm I'm not sure this is particularly a Going against that entirely, um, yeah, I, I would really have preferred if they didn't have him, you know, try to, yeah, you know, ta taking a, a prisoner of one of the men who had just worked hard to free him. I'd like to think that they were meaning to, to have a more positive and empathetic depiction. I'm not entirely sure. And let's see. I think the 
that might be about what there is that hmm. Um I th uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I like the thing, you know, Happy Sam Sawyer says, I hate that name about the Holland Commandos. Junior 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 says, I came up with that name, and Sam says, that you did. Like, he's not, he's not sorry. It's just, yeah, that's true. And, let's see, I think that might be about... Right, and the, yeah, also, you know, what would Cap say if I left his best girl behind? He'd say, do as Peggy says. And, let's see. Yeah, you know, when, when you know, Jack says, Jack, Jack relates the story about the white flag and says, everybody thinks that I'm this guy that I never was and every day it gets harder and harder to live with. I've been trying to tell that story since I came home from war. And Peggy says, you just did. And, yeah, someone, the, the person who entered this got the, the um, yeah, the acting, it's exactly right, writing, Thompson looks at her, seemingly vulnerable and grateful at the same time, realizing she is right. 